Hello everybody and welcome back to the Two Norries podcast. I am your host James Leonard, joined by my co-host Timmy Long. How are you everyone? Um, this week we have a lovely man, Damien Quinn. How are you doing? Yeah, he's down here on business from Galway. Um, before we get into Damien, I want to say a special thank you to my beautiful wife for helping us out today. Because hey. Rowan is not able. So Gillian is on the decks. Say hi Jill. Hi Jill. <laughs> But uh, look, without further ado, how are you keeping, Damien? Good now, and it's great to come down and see you guys. I've been watching you for a while. Brilliant. Uh, the first time I came across you, as everyone says, is Tommy Tiernan. Yeah. And um, I remember just thinking to myself when I seen your smile on the show, like it was a, a moment of self-actualization for you, like because you have come from such a place. And to get there and to be smiling the way you were was a really moving thing to see. Like, and yeah. So ever since then, I wanted to uh, find out more. I've been following your podcast and wondering yourself, Timmy, your own journey in that. Thank we you. all have our own little journeys, and yeah. I suppose I wanted to discuss a bit of mine with you as well. Yeah, and so, we wanted to get you on for a long time. Obviously, with lockdown, we couldn't, but you're in Cork for business anyway. Exactly. So the timing is great. Um, the Tommy Tern show it has been great like we spoke earlier um, a lot of good has come from that and people see the Tommy Tern show and people see people on the podcast like yourself and Timmy um, shiny pennies now with great <laughs> opportunities yeah. and great lives but mm. people don't understand the amount of work that it takes the years of work that it takes to get yourself mm. into this situation you know so you're going to give your experiences and just give another insight as to the steps you took. So I suppose you could identify with me and the Tommy Turn, and I know a little mm. bit about your story, but we'll just go from day one. Um, well, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Well, day one, like, uh, I suppose we grew, we're from Ireland originally, but we grew up in Manchester and we had a solid family unit in Man Manchester. Man United or Man City? Man United. Good man, good <laughs> right. man. It's important. We had, we had a solid family unit, like, and uh, for 13 years, it was, I was a very shy, kind of geeky young lad. And uh, Catholics, Irish growing up in England, which presented its own tra- uh, challenges. But then the family unit broke down and we, uh, we moved home with my mother and my brothers. And um, when we were back here then, we were English growing up in Ireland. Like, so we were blackguarded growing up for being Irish in England. And then when we got here, we, ha- we had the English being blackguarded because we were English. Like, so that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's yeah. back yeah. in that sense with regards to school. So, so anyhow, to move on from that, we, um, uh, from school, I was out of school by the age of uh, 14 and a half before junior search. And I had to go work in full time. And I got a full-time job, I was, but I was using as well at the same time. I was introduced to cannabis at around that age and um, knew full well when I was taking it. I still remember the first time I took it that I shouldn't be taking it, mm. but I still decided to take it because I, I just wanted to see what it was all about. And from there on, I just snowballed, like, you know, drugs. I kind of built my life around using drugs and uh, getting drugs and moving drugs. And um, that's what, that's all that interested me. In fact, I used to spend, I'd give hand up money to cover expenses, but the remainder of my wages went on drugs, drug mm-hmm. debts, and then I was selling drugs to pay for more drugs. Mm. And it was just uh, uh, madness. Now, at that time as well, like there was, uh, to, the town I come from, there's a strong manufacturing town, like that you could walk in and out of jobs at that time. Um, I had countless jobs manufacturing in different organizations, but what happened in 2002 was a lot of skilled people came into the country from different parts of the world with bags of qualifications. And I was a jack of all trades with no education and work dried up because I was messing with drugs. I wasn't turning in, all that kind of stuff. And then I found myself out of work again. So I stuck with what I knew, which was drugs and uh, and um, I stayed with that for a little while, and I decided that I wanted to change. I hadn't committed to change, but I decided I wanted to change. So I went to a local probation project and asked them would they take me in and uh, help me get my junior cert at the age of 23. What was the name of the project? Uh, Tune Community Training Centre. And uh, they were brilliant. Like, I was absolutely flying it there. Like, I was... Uh, they used to have like this bonus thing where every month somebody would get a bonus for putting in hard work and everybody knew I was going to get it <laughs> before, before it was given out. But 
everything was good on paper in there with them. Like they did provide tons of support, guidance, all that kind of stuff. But I was only telling them half the story. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't being honest with them. I wasn't being honest with anyone. And I ended up getting caught then uh, selling selling drugs. I got caught with a, a kilo of cannabis. And um, what age were you at that time? I was around twenty four. So I was after getting I was after getting my equivalent of the junior cert. Um, with TCs and they, they had great plans for me and I was I had great plans for myself but then that happened and um, I ended up uh, obviously in court and that and I got three years for the cannabis and stuff like that so what happened what transpired after getting caught was obviously everybody was pissed off at me do you know what I mean I had let down everybody that helped me in TCs um, I'd let myself down. There's a lot of people that liked me around the town that didn't like me anymore. Do you know, mm-hmm. I was that guy that mm-hmm. nobody wanted their kids hanging around, that kind of thing, do you know? So so all of that stuff was really hard to deal with because I'm not actually a bad guy, like, do you know what I mean? I'm a, I, I like to get on with people and I like, I, I like to think I'm a nice person, but I was... Do you, know, when I, do you know, when you're in prison, yeah, some of the best people you'll meet are inside in prison, do you know? Absolutely. They might have done bad things in the moment. Mm. Um but generally, people are nice people, you know. It's just circumstances and bad decisions and a lot of mitigating circumstances lead people to prison. But some of the best people I've met were yeah. inside in prison, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you a story about that. There was, a, a, like I had many rock bottoms when I got to prison. Uh, when I got to prison was one of them. And do you know how they tag your clothes in, in yeah. prison for the laundry? I had no tags on my clothes, and I was a charity case in prison anyways, but they signed all my clothes out to charity because they weren't tagged. Yeah. So I was literally left standing in what I was, all I owned, and it was actually a guy that was serving life that came over and gave me clothes. He gave me clothes, he gave me a load of clothes, and he said, you know, yeah. here you go, and off with you yeah. so the first thing I did when I got out I will get there was I bought him like I bought him a load of clothes and runners and yeah. just to say thanks and like kind of good luck you know yeah. because That's I nice thing, isn't it? I had no intentions of going back but I got to speak to him uh, briefly and he, he did say thanks and he said you're a man of your word which not a lot of people would say yeah, <laughs> you know but anyways um, going going to prison uh, before I got there like um, I kind of had the I made the decision that I was going to continue my studies in prison and there's nothing to try and convince the judge that you were a man with a plan when you were getting sentenced like I, I said look I, I told them at the time like I said look you send me there I'm going to have three square meals a day I'm going to be secure I'm going to know wh- what's coming down the road each day and I'm going to be able to get an education I said it would actually help if you sent me to prison and she'd done everything she could not to send me to prison you know because she knew I wanted to go and she didn't want to give me what I wanted but anyways, that was the decision I made at the time. I was going to use, the, like, they have a solid education unit there in Castlery. It was, um, the, first, the first thing I did when I got the chance was I went up and I, when, after being committed and saying, how do I get on, in on a course? Mm. And uh, straight away then I got in then, and that was my routine. So in the mornings I do the computer workshops. In the afternoon I do the school, and then in the evenings I do the gym in the yard. What way is Castlery? I've been, never been to Castlery. I've been to Cork and Shelton Abbey. Timmy's been to Cork, Shelton Abbey and the Midlands. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, what way is Castlery? Is it a big prison? Is it a relaxed prison? It's about, well, at the time now, they've done a lot since I was there. Like, I was there between 2006 and 2009. Um, they've actually built a new wing, and, they, and I believe there's showers in some of the cells and now. Do you know what's <laughs> It's a long way from slopping out and things like that, but I never experienced that in Castlery, like, but I know other, prison, other prisons still are experiencing that mm. in some instances. Mm. But now they have their own open jail up there as well, haven't they? Where they have housing? The houses, yeah. I got there at the very end of my sentence, but... Um, in, in, like I had a single cell up there and I kick out my door half seven in the evening. I was happy out and have my books and, and you know, I, I, it was, there was peace of mind in there. Like, do you mm. know what I mean? Like it weren't out trying, struggling out, trying to s- secure a roof for the night or any of that stuff. You know, you weren't worried about everybody kind of being pissed off at you. You know, you're away mm. from all that. Yeah. I seen prison as an escape from, the trouble I caused, but also yeah. as a way in which to kind of restructure and restart again. Yeah, I could it's, totally relate with that. Yeah, like, yeah. like prison at times was respite from the madness of being outside. I don't yeah. know. Does this sound weird? No, to people that they were saying what's gone through his head. But I remember 
being over a prison and actually thinking to myself what I wouldn't give to be back in there to mm. have the, the peace that I had in there because of the, the responsibilities I had when I came home mm. and the financial, the the family, all these different things. And I was just saying, it you know, got too much for me because I wasn't, I, I, I didn't really deal with all that stuff before I went in because I was, I was in the midst of addiction. And then when I came out, I was sober and clean and um, I had all these things and I just said, what I wouldn't give to be back up in Shelton Abbey walking around the gardens or on the Midlands in the school or, yeah. or wherever, wherever prison is just lock out the door in the evening and just sit there. And, yeah. You know. I remember there, there was, um, like, like, what you said there, like you know, your life is, it, it becomes unmanage, unmanageable when, when the shit hits the fan, like, excuse my language, yeah. you know, you have all sorts of different noise going on in your head. You can't, function like you know you're worrying about what's happening uh, you're 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 angry at yourself for getting involved in what you're involved in and the whole lot just really kind of comes in on top of you you see the second i was sentenced i remember the, the reporter said uh, damien quinn beamed as he walked out of the out of the courtroom after getting sentenced to three years beamed with delight but i was delighted because i knew that's the goal that's the end line do you know what i mean up until that point, there was no end line and there was no goal. So. It must have been really hard for you to say that your only option was to go to prison and get an education and to, to be away from everything that was going on for you on the outside. I didn't like the detective that caught me with, with the stuff, right? I, I, I didn't like him at all. But genuinely, that man saved my life. Yeah. He hated me as well. Like, do you know what I mean? There's no two ways about it. But he actually saved my life by catching me because I know... I'd still be doing what I was doing at that time if he didn't do mm-hmm. catch me, and um, or I'd be dead. Do you know what I mean? And that's that's the life I was living at that time. When he done that, it started a motion like a chain reaction, and I started thinking about where am I going? Is this for me? And it certainly wasn't for me, but I was going to make the most of that time. I had I was a man with a plan. It wasn't a great plan, mm. but the plan was to get a level of education in prison. So. What I'd done was I'd done a FETAC Level 5 overall business award and uh, I'd done really well in all of that. I'd done a advanced CCDL. I'd done uh, Level 6s in Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel, all that kind of stuff. And then I'd done an introduction study or an introduction course uh, to business studies with the Open University in there. And I remember I got a letter off, um, off the Open University saying I was the third highest out of 19 students, but I was the only one locked up. And That's the, amazing. The, yeah. the screws actually opened my cell door and I thought they were going tipping, tipping out the cell, searching, but they, didn't, they handed me the letter and shook my hand and, and said, well done from the governor. And the education unit in Castle Lee sounds fantastic. They were brilliant, yeah, they were. And, and it was really like, it, 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 I enjoyed going to it, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It, it, I took a lot from it, like, and the teachers up there were brilliant. There was Paddy, Rena, Angela. They're the three now that would be off the top of my head now that I remember teachers in there but they were well hi to them if they're watching yeah oh absolutely yeah and uh, and thanks a million for setting me off on the journey i've been going on um no no i do i do often wonder how they're getting on like in that and no it was it was a brilliant place like i remember then they moved me like halfway through the the fetac level five to lachlan house and the first thing i did when i got up there was i went into the governor and said please send me back to mm. Castle Ray. They said, why? They said, because uh, I said, I'm, I'm doing a course down there. I said, I'm halfway through it. I said, I'm not going to get it finished up here. And in fairness to Castle Ray, they actually sent some of the le- te- teachers up to Lachlan House to help me out to get through one of the payroll courses I was doing. Will you like, explain what Lachlan House is for the people that haven't a clue? Lachlan House is an open prison up in Cavan, Black Lion County Cavan. Now, grand, beautiful facility, but for me... I suppose when I was doing my time, I wanted to be able to kick out my door at half seven. You don't kick out your door up there like you're free, you're, like you're mingling and boredom sets in and all that kind of stuff. And you, you find yourself back doing what you don't want to be doing. That's my experience of it. You I, know? Was, you know, I had a similar experience when I went to Shelton Abbey and I was only there for a short time. Mm. But um, it, when you're in a, a closed prison, like Cork Prison in Castlery, like you, you know exactly where you are on any given time and any given day. Do you know? Like we said, gym in the morning, school in the afternoon, yard in the evening, mm. in, f- in for two hours, out for two hours. The day flies. When I went up to Shelton Abbey, first of all, I didn't know the prisoners from the prison officers because everybody wears their own clothes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the life was looked like they could have been the chief. 
to me, do you know what I mean? They all look the same, middle aged <laughs> men with lovely clothes, you know. You never, your door was never closed. You, you know, you come and go as you please. And I was like, the day is just dragged, you know. I just, I suppose if you're, you, I don't know, you were there for a longer time. How did you, did it take you a while to get settled into it? In Shelton Abbey, no, really, um, it depends on what kind of headspace you are and before you go in there. Yeah. You know, I was pretty much like yourself now in the education system. Um, and I was, by the time I went to Shelton Abbey, I was sober and clean for mm. over two years. So I knew what I had to do. I, uh, I knew what I had to do. I just had to keep going where I was and, and keep educating myself. But if you were somebody that was a little bit vulnerable um, and did touch off drugs and stuff while you were in the main prison, you could be going in there and you could be setting yourself up for a really, really bad time, you know. So, go on anyway, Tim, you were talking about Shelton Abbey. Yeah, Shelton Abbey, it's it's what you really want if you, if you want to go down that route and start um, fucking about with stuff that you were at in the, the main jail, you could... You could um you could be sent back and all your plans could be taken from you. But if you're someone who's level headed and you know what you want, you will keep doing what you want, you know. And you'll have the freedom of of the garden and shelter. Mm-hmm. Happy was something something I've I've never experienced in my life. So if you're ready to make the change, an open prison can be the best place for you. Yeah, well, like in fairness, I did say to the governor when I went in there that morning, please send me back. He said, no, I'm not going to send you back. Try it out. So I tried it out. Obviously, I didn't really see much of the governor. I tried it out for about a month, and I made a decision then when Man United bet Chelsea in the 2008 Champions League final to take a weekend for myself. So uh, I got my girlfriend at the time to pick me up. I left a note in my room, uh, which pretty much said I never wanted to be here anyway. I'll be back on Monday. Please don't touch my things. (laughs) And I, I headed off for the weekend, and I did. I came back on time. And uh, got back to Lockton House and they let me in. Sounds like the politest prison escape ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're telling me that they didn't give you the weekend, you just took it? Yeah, yeah, I decided to go for it. I walked out the gate wearing three changes of clothes yeah. and uh, got my partner to pick me up at the and time. you actually went back then? Went back on Monday as planned <laughs> because I knew they'd send me back. And you, if anyone, is and you will leave. Know, if anyone is listening to this. Uh, you do get weekends away in, in these open prisons, like, but you have to get them off the governor. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot just walk out the door no, no, and no. leave a letter. Yeah. No, I wouldn't advise it anyways. <laughs> but anyways, I walked, I walked it's in. It's <laughs> gas, isn't it? I walked in anyways uh, to the, the reception and I said, lads, look, I said, I'm tired. I said, just go up to the chokey, please. So they brought me up and stripped me off and threw me in the chokey. And then the governor came up the next morning and uh, he said, what do you think you were playing at? I said, look, I said, I came to see you. I said, when I first came, I said, I told you I didn't want to be here. I said, I had a lot going on in Castlery. I'm hoping that I'm going back there. Oh, for sure you are, he said. And he said, you do realize, he says, that you've got a tarnished prison record. I said, well, with all due respect, I said, no disrespect to you or all this prison. I said, but that means absolutely nothing to me. He said, how do you mean? I will never see the inside of one of these places again as long as I live. So that record means nothing to me. I said, listen, thanks. And I said, any chance of a smoke? And he actually got me a, a pack of tobacco off one of the boys. And I went back to Castlery and I got to finish what I was doing. So it was, all worked out in the end. Worked off, yeah. I got a weekend out. <laughs> I got a weekend <laughs> out, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So it was business as usual. And then when I went back to Castlery, like, there lots of, there was lot, look, in fairness, like, nobody should be getting themselves in trouble with the law. Uh, and and uh, I, look, I did what I did and I got myself there. And, but at the end of the day, like for the most part, they're they're just ordinary people that made some stupid mistakes or terrible mistakes. Yeah. Uh, and you know, did, did you have kids at the time? I did. And, 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 and how was it for your kids and your partner? Well, from, were you being away? We were separated anyway, myself and the partner. But my mother used to bring my child up to see me once a month, and which wasn't which wasn't uh, the best place to be bringing them. Like, do you know what I mean? Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was difficult. Like, I'd write to him, like, I'd write to him once a week. I'd tell him what I was doing, what my plans are, make poems, and I'd send them to him. And, you know, um, and for the most part, like, we lived up to that, like, you know, um, 
Um, he's trying to make his do his best yeah. as you can. Yeah, yeah, and like he, he's at his age now, he's uh, he's pretty much <laughs> too like me to, uh, uh, you know, I'd say we're, our personalities are very the same and he is currently going through his own journey of discovery right now and uh, he knows he knows I'm here for him, like, but yeah. at the same time, when my father was trying to talk sense to me, I wouldn't listen to him, so I'm pretty sure that that's the case now. Yeah. Um, look, he's a great guy, he's a great young lad, and he, everybody that knows him and speaks to me about him says he's a lovely lad, like, and all that, and he absolutely is, but... He'd he find just, his way. He, he's just know. finding his way, yeah. yeah and I had the same, I had a similar experience, my own family, you know, and I, I wouldn't listen to my family either, or my dad and that, but um, eventually, you know, when you're ready, you just kind of latch onto them for support, then, and you'll always be there. Mm. Um, and he'd find his way, you know what I mean? Yeah. You, like, all you can do today is what you're doing. Exactly, and, yeah. You know, and keep doing front. it, yeah. yeah. Mm. Can I ask you about when you got out, how you found the reintegration process? Yeah, when I got out now, it, it was, um, like, as I said, like I did achieve quite well in there. Linkage was helping out now. Linkage was fairly new. Like, well, link- explain linkage for the people that don't know. Linkage is just like it's a service that's run by the Irish Association of... Uh, Social Integration. Opportunities, of yeah, or, yeah. yeah. And um, they, they, they basically visit you in prison and try and tee things up for you for when you get out. And uh, in fairness, like, there was a lovely woman there, Rita Spencer, she was amazing. And she'd done the best she could with what she had, you know. And um, Jerry Williams as well, he used to come and see me as well. But I had all these huge, like, I, I'd i done really well in prison at the time. I had all these great plans and aspirations and all this stuff. Uh, but when I got out, I, saw, I found out quite quickly, like, that people judged you on where you were after coming from rather than everything you did done to, to sort yourself out and tear yourself up for when you got out. So... Yeah, and for the, for the Cork people watching, uh, the linkage officer in Cork is Maria Walsh. So okay. Hi, hi to Maria Walsh. I know hi, Maria. Hi, well. Maria. I was over there with her on a college placement, and Gillian would know her well as well, yeah, and Timmy yeah. would know her too, yeah. you know. Yeah. But um, they're a great service. They also have the resettlement, and there's various strands. Yeah, they're all here. new, yeah. Um, did you find that your going for employment and education opportunities, that your conviction was a, an obstacle for you? Absolutely, yeah. I couldn't get on. I couldn't get on because of my convictions. Like you, you apply for a house off the council, Garda Vetten. You apply for insurance, Garda Vetten. You apply for a job, Garda Vetten. You apply to college, Garda Vetten. Do you know the, every every time you apply yourself, you're subject to that, and decisions are made based on very low points in your life like you know they're not the the most dazzling uh, um, uh, I suppose points about a person that are displayed that the weak there's moments of your weak they're your weakest moments and and, and, and you pay for it again and again in how them. do you actually feel I mean when you're you're after being told that you, you don't get the job or you don't get the course because of your qualifications and you know that you're actually working as hard as you possibly can to change your life it, you know you're doing all the right things you're after changing all your behaviors you're going to college you're trying to go to college you're trying to get a job and people are still judging you on your past and no less mention it i don't know like i think it was just a bit of marijuana or whatever weed and maybe a few other bits but everything pieces. like i did you know? use i used like, everything to me like that, like that just sounds like yeah. In other parts of the world, in different countries, marijuana is legalized, mm. and, yeah. and like back here, it's not. Yeah. You know, um, in England, it's not. But the reason I'm asking this question is because I I felt the same. I felt I was never going to get the job I wanted, even though I was applying myself in the course I was doing as best uh, as I possibly could, and I thought I've I was doing well, but I knew. My guard vet, if the guard vetting situation ever did come up, mm. I know it, it would be downhill. Like it's an Achilles heel, is what I call it. Like it's baggage that you're bringing around with you everywhere. Like it obviously, obviously, it is demotivating. You know that you can do certain roles, tasks, all that stuff. You know you're well able for it. But when the vetting comes back, then it is a demotivating th- feeling. You know, like I had no problem discussing my past with people, and I have. Like, I went for hundreds of jobs, and uh, same old story. You'd always revert back to, oh, cheers, what happened there? Look, that happened, but, like, I've done everything else 
since that time. Let's talk about that is where I try and bring the conversation. But it, they just don't, once they hear, oh, you were in trouble for whatever you were in trouble for, they just want to know more about that. And then that's the end of the road. Like, And, and, and it's th- like, um, do you know, if you're going for a position, um, let's say there's one position in an organization mm. and you all have, there's 20 applicants it's like the conviction is used as a way to filter out. Exactly. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. it's so disheartening, especially when it's in the application form. Um, you have to tick the box. You know, like if you see an application form, mm. like that, I, I don't go for it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But there is some good employers as well, you know, and some people are good people and doors will open. But I think for people that have been in prison or people that have convictions, because not all people with convictions have been in prison, but it's the same effect. Mm. Sometimes you just have to do more interviews than the other person, you know what I mean? You have to knock on more oh, doors crying, and yeah. put up more disappointment, but you keep plugging away. I remember when I was in the Life Centre on placement, uh, Dan O'Leary, who we had on the podcast, he says to me, because um, I went to Dan after getting blown out for a load of placements when I was doing the community degree, I couldn't get a placement because my conviction was only not a few months ago, you know what I mean, 2014, and he, and he gave me a placement, like, and he said... Um, Whatever you do, he says, finish out your degree, keep doing what you're doing. He says, you'll come up against a lot of obstacles, but you'll come up against good people too that will open doors for you. And that has been my experience, you know, yeah. being going to interviews and or, um, not getting jobs because of the conviction. But at the same time, I got good opportunities as well. And the conviction was seen as something that added to the character. And if you can overcome and build yourself up from them lows, as you said, a very low point in your life, if you can build yourself up to a position where you're in, you know, interviewing for a job, you must have character, you know, you must have mm. been able to plan a work ethic, all these traits that any employer would be lucky to have, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, somebody coming from that kind of background as well, what I've noticed even for myself is, they're willing to work really, really hard. And it's not easy to get away from mm. that kind of life. No, no. The, the, the crime and criminality life where there's drugs involved and violence. And it's not easy to change your behaviours and to separate yourself from an environment that was the only place you were ever used to growing up. And to go into another environment where people are, they, they, they don't know about that kind of, yeah. That side of the fence, if that's the right word to say. Yeah, yeah. You know, and try to be accepted then by these people as well and change and do all the right things at the same time and then to be disheartened by saying, nah, we can't take you on. Yeah. But yeah. you know, when somebody does get an opportunity though, they'd be so grateful for it and they'd be the, they'll be the best employee in that company yeah. mm. because they'll be so grateful for the opportunity and they'll want to prove that they were justified in giving them the job in spite of the convictions. But we'll go back to you, sorry. About that. <laughs> You're all right, you work away. <laughs> no, the reason yeah. we did go on a little yeah, tangent. We can relate. Yeah, we can oh, say yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, that's why I'm here to talk to yeah, you, because exactly. we all know what it's like. Um, I suppose where, where, where that brought me then, you know, all the, the knockbacks, the knockbacks, the knockbacks. Um, they did put me onto like a course doing level three again, which I had done before I went to prison. And that was just like uh, seen by me as a just complete backwards step, a waste of time. And like all, um, I suppose, the, the ambition and determination and positivity built up in prison for my release faded quite quickly. And I ended up relapsing and... <laughs> Jesus, like uh, the madness of it like um do you, do you think that the disappointments led to the relapse oh yeah absolutely there was a, the primary contributor to that like because i i wanted to get out and prove everybody that, that mattered not everybody everybody that mattered to me that i had changed and i wanted to change but was there a relapse into drugs and offending behaviour or just one of the two? It was a mixture, actually, because I got that out of my head. Um, what, <laughs> I actually broke the law by unknown to myself. I walked into somebody's house I thought it was my own. I was off my head on a load of yokes. And um, I, 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 they said it in the court, the people that were there, like they said... Uh, they said he walked in and he opened the drawer like he was looking for a charge or something. <laughs> and when when I got out of the house, obviously they rang the guards and I flagged down the the, the guard care. I think it was a taxi and they just arrested me. <laughs> so 
But you would do things like that. And, yeah, uh, I was well excellent. out of it now. Like I was, I was genuinely like I was, I was kind of at the time I was kind of dealing with like suicidal thoughts, and I was kind of hoping that the drugs would do me in, mm. and um, that type of a that type of a mindset was going on. But anyways, they brought me down to the station, and uh, obviously I was bopping away in the cell, <laughs> listening to the music in my head. <laughs> and I remember when I got out there, and I walked out, and I looked down the road, I looked up the road, and I, I went back into the station and said. Please tell me the name of the town out there. <laughs> I didn't know what town it was in. Do you know, I I didn't I genuinely didn't know where I was. But um, anyhow, after that, then I decided to run, and run as far and as fast as I could, and I ended up going out working for a family in uh, in in Germany and France. They're an Irish company that did tarmac and stuff like that, and I worked with with them for a little while and. Uh, the morals and like I didn't like doing the work, so um, uh, I fucked off to England. But like while I was out there, I ended up homeless in France for two weeks. <laughs> the what time was that, of the, like? that was fucking scary. Mm. It was horrifying. Um, I I, um, I took off from the gang I was with, and I remember um, the next morning I went to a church in a place called Rainbow Court. In the north of France, and uh, I sat down and I listened into the church. And um, after church, then I stood outside. I had my bag with me and everything, and I just looked at the people that were there, and I, I I started crying and I pointed down that way, that way, that way, that way. I just went like that. I don't know where I am. So this guy brought me to some sort of place. It was called the Companions of Hope, and they have like a like I suppose it's a place for fallen people. Yeah. And I was there for two weeks and I had no charger for my phone, no French, none of that stuff. And um, a guy came in with a charger for my phone and I was able to get going again. But yes, that was scary. Like, you know, yeah, I can imagine. You know, you can, yeah. So after that, then I'd done a small bit more work with them guys and I got enough money to scrape it back to Manchester. Uh, uh, I remember I got off the, the train drunk, being carried by. Um, by uh, police, <laughs> and oh, no. they were they had me by both arms and legs. Literally, they couldn't wake me up on the train. But it wasn't that it was messing or anything. It was just the journey it got to me. And uh, when I when I came out, I said, Dude, "What are you doing?" And they put me down. And I said, "Where am I? You're in Manchester." I said, "Oh, it's all right. I know where I am now." I said, just let me go. So I went to see a friend, and he took me in, and um, I started to. I got a job with a debt management company of all things, like, you know, and I owe to my eyeballs and debts for drugs, <laughs> mental stuff, like, right? And uh, I stuck that out for a while, but it, it, with all of that stuff going on, like psychosis has started setting in, and um, that job didn't last more than two months, and um, I ended up then walking the streets of Manchester for about three months until my family found me and got me home. And and I I went into a psychiatric unit for a little while to get over the uh, the psychosis. So yeah, it was. How long was that for? How long were you in that in the psychosis? Thing? Oh, I'd say the guts of about half a year, anyways, at least. Were you in the psychiatric hospital for that length of time as well? No, about six six weeks. Six How was weeks. that? Well, from what I remember, it was grand. Like I medicated, put all, medicated a bit of weight and all that, and they gave me medication going. Actually, the, the, that was one of the things that kind of helped me escape that was the fact that I just fucked the medication off. Excuse my language. Yeah. It was, uh, I remember my brother, my little brother, he took me in uh, when I came back around. And, it, and, and like, you know, he, he, fairness to him, like he it was, uh, he he saved me there in that sense. And um, when you're at your lowest, your yeah. family is, is what, was, what um, is that? Take your time. Context. But yeah, when you're at your lowest, you know what I mean. Your family is yeah, all that matters, like. Yeah, I remember then um, we uh, I got I got up one day, <laughs> and uh, he said, "How are you?" I said, "Grand." I said, "What time is it?" He said, "Don't you mean what day is it?" I said, "How do you mean?" He said, "You've been asleep for the last three days." Mm. I said, "Are you serious?" He said, "Sleep for three days." So I made the decision then to put the medication in the bin, and after that, then I started kind of coming round to myself, and um, slowly but surely, and. Uh, then, what, what kind of things did you do after you dropped the medication? Like what? Are, what? Are, like obviously, when you drop the medication, you have to find alternative methods to keep your mental health stable. You know. I think I was just coming around to myself. Like all the the, the drugs and everything is just all Detox worn away. Them. Like and and yeah, it was like a kind of a 
it was a refreshing kind of a feeling because like I was I was thinking straight and all this kind of stuff, you know, like I substance free for the first time in a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking straight and uh I was coming around to myself and um, then shortly after that then I met my partner, my cur- the mother Jody is her name and uh Hi Jody. Uh, she she um, she she saved the rest of me then, like you know. So um, we've been together ten years, and we've uh, we've a little boy now as well, like and and you know we've been really really happy. I can see you're getting a little bit emotional just talking. Or I, I'm the same when I speak about my own wife, in in terms of what she's done for me, because yeah. I would have never got sober and clean unless I had somebody like her in my life. Because I really didn't care whether I lived or died while I was in addiction. You know, I had two kids as well at the time, mm. but I fought for her and the kids, you know, and, yeah. and today we're happy. We have a good relationship. We have our uppers and downs, you know, when, when my decision, m- my decision is not the same as hers and um, <laughs> it's normal. That's a relationship, but most of the time it's, it's very healthy, you know, and I think it's very important to have somebody like that in our lives. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I think yeah. behind every good man is a great there's woman. A great woman. I think, there's a better woman. And I think the I the key it. the key to a good long relationship is when you come to it, when there's a disagreement in the relationship, you sit down and discuss it like adults and you both agree that she was right. <laughs> Not right, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> even when she's wrong. Exactly. That's the key. Even when she's wrong is when the most important time is when she's right. Yeah. <laughs> but how we joke, we joke, we kid, we kid. The women, yeah, but women are great and uh, uh, like uh, in the criminology literature um, they talk about uh, hooks for change like something that you can hook onto that can help you with your desistance journey desistance for people that don't know is like um, abstinence from crime and offending behaviour some people use education employment children relationships but you have to find that hook and do not hook onto that, and th- yeah. that, that 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 can help you she with was the change certainly process. Mine. She was certainly mine. Like, do you remember that feeling when you get really excited about something? I hadn't experienced that in a long time before I s- met her, and then we just every time every time she was calling down or whatever, that feeling yeah. came. It made me want to be a better person. And yeah. uh, that, the, the, school, the excitement you have yeah, when yeah. you're going on your school tour when you're young yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I'll, that get, really I'll get in your script from the chemist later on in life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That, yeah I know exactly that what that is. That warm, fuzzy feeling that yeah. was vacant for a long time, like that I hadn't experienced in years. I experienced that when I met her, like, and... That's look, beautiful. look, I know, I know, I know I annoy the shit out of her, like, and, and she reckons I do way too much, like, and all this kind of stuff, but she supports me every step of the way, and she's just, she's an amazing mother as well, so, um, I've name? been, uh, Jody, Jody, uh, yeah, big shout out Jody, well long, yeah, and she's, uh, I was very lucky to meet her, so, yeah. Yeah. so, with, I'm, I'm, sorry, what's, uh, what's your life like today, since you sorted yourself out, met Jody, had another child, stayed in recovery, mm. your away from offending behaviour what steps have you taken to rebuild your life I suppose well shortly after meeting her I like I had been I'd given up on looking for jobs because I couldn't get one all right so uh, Equal Ireland um, advertised a course in business and community development like and I had an interest in business studies from prison and a desire to give back so it made perfect sense to go for that course I didn't know how I was going to pay for it but I signed up and I and, I, and I took the plunge. They're based in Galway, but they're a national outfit. Like it's 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 a group of institutes of technologies that have come together to do this thing to help people that have been out of education for for a long time get back in. So I done my level six with them, and, and shortly after starting that, then I got a, a job through a friend in a distribution company, and I I always had a bit of a flair for distribution, so. Um, it worked, it worked quite well. <laughs> you use what strengths you have. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah. Good sales, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> um, but um, the, the um, where what happened there then was I took kept on the two like I was working, studying and working, and um, that helped me to pay for further education as well. Like, and in that job then I I became evening supervisor and then night manager, and then I was able to hire other lads like myself from different backgrounds or whatever that I knew needed to get a break too. And a lot of them fellows are still working today. And that was a really, really nice thing to be able to do. So mm. I went right through level six, level seven and level eight with Equal Ireland up until I said, you know what, I'll test the water here now and I'll try vetting again and see how I get on. 
and same old sh- same old stuff like you know we wanted to my myself and my partner we wanted to try for a child like and she yeah. didn't want me working nights and she wanted me at home with her like obviously yeah. and i wanted to be at home with her too of course so um so I kept trying, 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 and I couldn't get anywhere. So I came across a job then where vetting wasn't required with the auctioneer that I work with now. And a week after starting with him, he pulled me up on what he read and seen, like, you know. Mm. And uh, he said, what's this all about? I said, well, that's only a bit of it. <laughs> I'll tell you the rest, like. And um, I told him the rest, and he, he resigned to the fact that we all have things in our past that we'd like to forget about and move on from. Yeah. He said, you seem to know what you're doing, so let's give it a go. And I'm still working with him today. He totally supports me in everything that what's I that do. What's that man's name? His name is Pat Callanan. Pat, well done. And, and, and I mean that because... That's a massive thing you've done there to help this man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well done. You know, yeah, and he, you know, it goes back to the point we made earlier. Like, that was the one person that gave you that that yeah. opportunity from time to time, and you're still there. Still there, you know, yeah. like, And it goes back to what we were saying. Like, when you give people a chance to prove themselves, they'll take it with both hands, and they'll be the best employee. Both hands, know? yeah. Yeah, both and you're, you're living proof of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, and you're learning the trade as well as. as yeah, oh yeah, you know? yeah. Like in fairness, that man has taught me more about business than you'd ever read in a book. Like he's a shrewd operator for sure, but he's a, a genuine friend outside of that. Like we'd often go for like a bike ride. He's into cycling. I'm a cyclist. As mm. I'm sure you are yourself. But um, um like we 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 go out for a spin with the local cycling club and. It'll always end up as a race between myself and himself, yeah. and he's as fit as a fiddle, like. And, and uh, but yeah, yeah, and look, he, he is, he's brilliant, like. Uh, I know, like, uh, friends outside of the job as well, like, you know, and he supports me. He knows I'm heavily involved in community development, and that's what I, I love. And uh, he's he's he supports me all all the way on that. Good Are you still living in uh, June? Uh, no, I live, I live in outside of Athenry. Outside of Athenry, yeah. you know, is that same community that um would have. Um, looked at you as somebody that had a criminal record years and years ago when no, you were involved the, in crime. The new community knows all about it. Like myself and Pat were actually on the news there. Like, and, and they accept you exactly th- for yeah, who you yeah, are for accept- the changes you've. Yeah. yeah I've fantastic. made a point of like, it's like at the end of the day, like there's another guy I know. He said when I mentioned when I mentioned uh, Garda Vetting and criminal convictions, he said, "Why are you wearing it like a fucking tattoo on your forehead?" I said, "Because every time I apply myself, I have to go there." Mm. So it's to, like we're addicted to the knockdowns as well. Yeah, you know, it's just like because you know it might be coming down the line, so you just want to save yourself the disappointment yeah. and kind of lay it all out the table there and then. Isn't yeah, it? just get it out of the way. Like, yeah. um, I remember like when I was approached to become the secretary for County Community Games at Galway. Um, Tony, he was uh, he's the vice president of Community Games Ireland. A really good man, but he he sadly passed away there recently, but. The conversation came up about Gerda Vettin and um, I said, look, Tony, I said, I'm going to have to stop you there. Look, before we even go there, this is what's going to come back. And uh, he said, all right, OK. And he just kind of sat back like that for a second. And then he sat back into me and said, well, what have you done since that time? You know, That's and I didn't even know how to answer him because I was expecting to say, well, I did all this shit back then. But no, what have you done since that time? And I genuinely couldn't say all of the positive things that have happened since. I couldn't get them out quick enough. I didn't know how to answer them mm. because I'd never been asked that in an interview situation. Mm. I was only asked about what, what, why I did what I did, you know, or how that came about. Or it just never went yeah. that direction ever. Mm. So after three months, anyways, I got over the line, and I, I am the county secretary with the Community Games Ireland, and I love doing that because it's, it's my way of giving back. And it's actually, in, in a sense, it's kind of like. Uh, <laughs> having experience in the childhood I should have had maybe yeah. do you know when you see them all the camaraderie the sports the the, the community the, all that stuff do you know it's it's lovely to see it's like. disappointing though with the inconsistency like um, it was great that you got that there was no better man for that do you know what mm. I mean I remember went for a sports hour and a voluntary thing now working with um, children of people who were in prison. Okay. You know? Yeah. And they were looking for volunteers. I said, fuck it, that'd be great. You know what I mean? There was a couple of weeks, sports, weeks, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't get it because of convictions. Now, at this stage, I had a bachelor's degree. I had a master's degree. I was working for a few years in youth settings and everything, you mm. know? Um, but it's just that inconsistency. Like, you never know what organization is going to accept you, is not going to accept you. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, that's the disheartening thing. You yeah. know, if there was like, a, a, maybe you have an opinion on what the legislation should be, but I think like it should be taken out of that individual mm. organization's power. And if you're so many years or you've done so many things that you're, you, you get a green tick or something from the state to say, you know what, that person is, deserves to be able to move on with their life. They've done all this. In the meantime, such a time has passed. They've proven, they've changed. They don't have to go away and declare convictions every time for the rest of their life, you know. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, well, they do have the Spent Convictions Act and the Spent Conviction Act only goes so far, like... It's not the, relevant for 99% of people. Yeah, no, no. None of us will ever benefit no. from that because we had more than one or two convictions. Do you want to explain the Spent Convictions for people that don't understand or well, don't know? A Spent Conviction will come into effect if you've only had one charge and it'll it'll be spent after seven years. That's the basic understanding of it. If you have more than one or, or two convictions, it doesn't apply. So you will technically have to disclose your convictions for the rest of your life, regardless of the, the crime that you've done. Yeah, so spent convictions, uh, basically, if you have one charge or more, um, uh, you won't benefit from that. Um, but if it's just one charge, like a public order or a road traffic offence, uh, you will you'll benefit from it seven years down the road. But like... The likes of us here now that have had a, num a number of charges. For the rest of our lives under current legislation, we will have to disclose our criminal convictions. So if we decide to move on or if we have to move on, we will be subject to guard of it no matter where we apply. So um, one of my things that I'm currently doing is I'm working on like a mentoring program. This is derived from the recognition of prior learning. Uh, which is practiced in ETBs and ITs, education and training boards and institutes of technology, where people have life experience that left school when they were 17. They might have gone working in an office. They might have picked up computer skills or Microsoft Word or mm. customer care on the phone or, you know, business administration skills, but they don't actually have the, the qualification. But by going through the recognition of prior learning process, you can demonstrate that on a portfolio and get your qualifications based on that experience. And ITs are accepting it. Like I've seen people come from Leaving Cert and go straight on to a level eight because they have that business experience. Mm. It's happened numerous times with Equal Iron. Like, and I'm actually an RPL practitioner now because I've done the course last year. So I can help people go through that process and, yeah. and, and, and I do any chance I get, I help people with that type of thing. Yeah. But I think that whole thinking in the academic sense can be flipped with rehabilitation. So vetting, we go for Garda vetting or if we were to try, if we were to demonstrate our commitment to change, right? We could document that. We could get the guards to take a look at it. We could get probation to take a look at it. We actually have integrated service management programs in prison that start on committal anyway that monitor how you get on in prison. Yeah. Like, you know, some of us mess, some of us don't. But so we engage in the workshops. We engage in the education units. We keep ourselves clean. We don't go fighting and blackguarding. Do There's you know, a designated ISM officer. ISM, yeah. So th and, and what I'm proposing then is that this would be a follow-on to that then when you get out. What are you doing to secure a house? What you, what you did to secure a house? What you did to secure a course? Who you're engaging with? Are you giving clean urines? Like if you're genuinely serious about changing, you'd have no problem sharing that information. You Do you think like. that um, it would be helpful for, I suppose, John, when you're talking about urines and kind of engaging with services afterwards, mm -hmm. to be... It, it, the, I suppose the big thing there is voluntary and involuntary, you know, mm. involuntary mean temporary release, probation, suspended sentence, Yeah. voluntary, that means your prison sentence is finished yeah. and you're released, it's off your own back, you know. Yeah. Um, do you think that everybody would benefit from being able to serve the end of their sentence in the community? I think there's a real problem because, like, some people fall out of uh, the, the the structures that are there, like, you know, b just because they don't meet the criteria, like, you know what I mean? So, EASIO has programs, but other certain offences don't fit that bill, and people fall out through the gap, do you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. like, what I'm proposing is that, like, I, I know in my heart and soul, if I have to go for a job tomorrow morning and say, God forbid, my current job ended, I'd be subject to vetting again, and I'd be, ch I'd be struggling with it, and I'd, I'd find it really hard to go through all that stuff again. 
I, I'm just caught, like, I'd be caught on that same old wheel that I was caught on previously. And um, I think this thing will help with that. Do you know, it'll stop that. Like, I've, I haven't been convicted in years of anything, but I still have convictions. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I think that they need to look at the vetting disclosure process. So what I would look to, to do is kind of build like a, a portfolio of commitment to change that there are certain benchmarks that the, the prison service would like to see, that the guards would like to see, that probation would like to see, that the council would like to see, the HSE, whoever. They, they have benchmarks that would, where they would see somebody that was recovering, that jazz, he's on, mm. he, he or she is, they're, they're doing it. Like, do you know what I mean? And I can say that they're doing it. I'd be happy enough to sign that they're doing it. So mm. basically what we're talking about, so is maybe a board or somebody that has a check that checks in with people that have been to prison that are on a recovery route, yeah. educational route where they can say, right, this person's after doing this and this and this since their last conviction. Yeah. Maybe we should, every time the guard of vetting does come up for a job opportunity, why not have this section that the company looks at as well? Yeah. And just show, like, it's not all bad. This person stopped 10 years ago was the last conviction. Yeah. Since then, they've got their master's degree, their, mm. on, their honours degree. They're after doing five years, in my case, six years of psychotherapy and psychology with, with different people. Mm. You know, that never comes into place when the vetting comes up. No. Yeah. That would be a very, very, very important area to be included. Because yeah. the, the problem there, what you're talking about, is... When the employer gets the guard of vetting from the vetting bureau, it arrives with no context. It's no. just dates, court cases, and sentences. Mm. There's nothing else attached to that form. Yeah. So do you think that having this other thing attached to it, where yeah. mm. there's certain benchmarks like a year of no offending, a year of drug-free, approved, you know, education, employment, all these things should accompany the vetting exactly that yeah but like when 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 everybody is satisfied that there is a level of commitment to change uh, we 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 as ex offenders that understand that we would prepare that and we would pass it on to the probations and that for them to assess it wouldn't yeah. be us to be assessing it probation and the guards and all them people would be assessing it and then when they sign off on it then the vetting bureau would issue a, a certificate of commitment to change alongside which would suggest that this person needs a chance, give them a chance, yeah. you know, because that's not what happens. The communication is this person did all these things. End of story. Mm. Make your decision based on that. Yeah. We're a bit away from all that, I think, though. No, in, but in that makes a lot yeah. of sense, though. Like it that. makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. But we're living in a... Listen, it's... But saying yeah. that now, right... I like the new Minister for Justice, Helen McKenty. Yeah, she's nice. I, I yeah. think that she's progressive, as Fine Gael's are not really progressive, but I think I like kind of what I've seen so far. Yeah. Um, obviously, Senator Lynn Rowan is in the Shannon, and yeah. this would be her baby too. Yeah, you know? we spoke. I think that there's certain people, do you know, there's, do you know people, there's a, there's a change in society, I think, around how people view the likes of me, you and Timmy. Yeah. Um, and I think that may, we're not, may, maybe we're not that far away from no, something. No, that's no. the point of it. We're not to a place where people are looking at you, James, and me and saying, oh, um, let's also look at what kind of childhood do they have? What kind of... What kind of uh, Just the context teaching, of it. Like, exactly, yeah. You know, yeah. all that plays a part in the conviction. So mm. as well. No, it doesn't all the time. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't no. all the time. But no. in my case, growing up, with a single parent, two younger brothers, you know, and the year we like, yeah. <laughs> I was only having a conversation with somebody else there recently, and like, you could see the way I was turning out at the age of seven and eight years of age. You could, see, if you could portray me twenty years down the line, and you were somebody that a psychologist or somebody that was involved in that area of study, you knew that I was going to be addicted to drugs. Yeah. You knew I was going to be in prison. You know. Arald's dead. Yeah. yeah. You know. It's like that, that A study, you know. It's like if there, if you have four or more aces, your likelihood of ending up in prison and psychiatric service and homelessness is multiplied. And if you have seven or eight, it's nearly a guarantee. And if you're dealing with a psychologist when you're 15 and you have all these issues, of course, that psychologist is going to look at that and say, unless there's serious change here, this person is destined for this life. Exactly. You know. 
Yeah, well, um, well, well, what, what this journey has taken, like this thing is something I've put to probation, like, and I'm talking to probation about, but like, um, I was going to give up on my education up until I came across the master's. Um, there was a woman by the name of Siobhan Cafferty. She's a social enterprise and development officer with the Irish Prison Service and Probation. And I heard her story at the open day of uh, a course I did where she was, she wrote a paper on reintegrating violent uh, prisoners into the workforce. And like, I was going to walk away from education at that time up until I heard that because I was sick of the vetting and I didn't want to go wasting any more money on an education I couldn't use. So uh, <laughs> I heard her story anyways, and I reached out to her straight away. I said, this is amazing. How, how, is there any way I can help kind of thing and all this kind of stuff? And I went ahead and I done the same master's. And I wrote the paper then, which was called Spiranua. Spiranua is Irish for New Horizon. Um, yeah, that's 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 the paper. Well, no, that's sorry, that's that's a project. That's a project that that came from it there. Yeah. But um, the 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 paper was written anyway, and the likes of Lynn Ruan, uh, yeah. she fed into it. Siobhan Cafferty fed into it. Um, there was a, a number of probation officers, guards. Like, we all done the interviews, the Zoom interviews and everything on it. And it was actually, they were really, really helpful people. Like, they were fully behind the concept. And that led to then um, me being invited by the Department of Justice to speak at their launch of the Social Enterprise and Employment Strategy for 21-23. So Helen McIntyre opened and I was speaking then after her and uh, about my journey and what the strategy means to me and people like me. And, and um, it was really good to get to do that. Um, so, yeah, th- we're... Mm-hmm. Par- Siobhan Cafferty helped me then with this notion I have like there is work in in America they have certificates of commitment or certificates of rehabilitation uh, so like that people can use to, so there's precedent in other jurisdictions there is yeah so it's not it's not a totally new concept recognition of prior learning has been around in an academic sense for 30 years mm. you know so like they do see how it can be tweaked and stuff like that so but, what kind of information is in this in, in in this thing here, no, this is just a proposal, like, for right. mentor. It's basically m- mentoring uh, just to help people kind of, you know, sell themselves properly and yeah. show what they've done since they got into trouble. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an incentive. Like, there's an acceptance there that there isn't really much incentive to change when you hit so many barriers. Do you know, when you, when, you, when you come up against a brick wall time and time again, it doesn't incentivize anybody to make any any positive change, you know. And, like... Where I come from now, I know here, like you've a beautiful city here. Dublin is a beautiful city as well. Like, but when you're out in the in the western side of the country, like they, they often talk about balanced regional development. Mm. Like all roads lead to Dublin, all roads lead to Cork. When you're out the countryside, you know the services the services aren't as good yeah. as what they should be. Do you know? And 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 that's down to populations and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time. Our story is in every town in Ireland, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. People like us are in every town of Ireland that have struggled with life and struggled with circumstances and and, yeah. and went on difficult journeys and caused difficult journeys, you know. And yeah. so, so this thing is about kind of, uh, like, the statistics are that half the people that get out of prison end up back in there within the first three years. So, like, do you know, what type of a journey is that to be mm. on? Yeah. You know, like I, what I would like to see is this this thing changing that, bringing down them statistics. You know, helping people realize how. Like when I went through the recognition of prior learning process myself, I done it on myself. I was actually really, really. It gave me a boost. Like so I could, that's your roadmap, and whoever else helped you to make it to helping people like us. Yeah, to to make progress in their lives with, with jobs and, and, and education and all that. Where would somebody want to get so, get that paper if they I want can, I can give it to anyone. You can yeah, give it yeah, to anybody. Yeah, yeah. So we, we can link it in the description of this yeah, video. No, no, I'm leaving. Can, I have it there for you anyway, do you know? Yeah. I have, well, you, might have a P, there. you might have a PDF copy I do, that yeah, I can I send to people yeah, if yeah. they request it. The, um, the main thing I'd want people to do is log on to um, uh, Siobhan Cafferty's website at workingtochange.ie and there is a box. It's, it's, a, it's a box where you can... Uh, people with with that have faced difficulties where they can say what type of blocks they've experienced and stuff like that. Yeah. 
mm. when it comes to kind of pushing on and moving on and getting jobs or getting colleges just to, even if it's something as simple as getting a driving license or setting up a bank account or any of them types of things that you fill it in on that form www.workingtochange.ie and um, there's stories on my own stories on that website but there's other stories as well and um, it, it's, it's a useful tool because the working to change social enterprise and employment strategy has 46 recommendations to help people whether it's social enterprise development direct employment or entrepreneurship and all of them supports are in there to to help people like us you know Mm -hmm. reintegrate into employment and just have an income and have a normal life and you know i i I can't sing these praises any more than yeah. than I am like you know I I'm really excited by it because it's the first time I've seen light at the end of the tunnel and I've had a fairly good I've had a fairly good run like considering where I've come from but if yeah. this level of support was out when I got out of prison I'd say my journey wouldn't have taken half as long exactly do you know what I mean uh, so yeah. look, do you know what you've a, you've a great story and yeah. before we wrap up you're graduating from UCC with your <laughs> masters on Monday. Monday, yeah. Today Monday. is Saturday. Yeah, Congratulations yeah. on that. Thanks, yeah. yeah. What's, what's that masters? Uh, it's a masters in social enterprise and cooperatives. Cooperative exactly, social yeah, enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Well yeah. done on yeah. that. That's well, an achievement. Yeah, Cheers, it's unreal. And Thank you're you. a, you're a gent. Thank you. No, you're and a lovely likewise, guy. Likewise, you all are really yeah. nice people. And we've got maybe ten years ago, I'd know what you <laughs> like us all yeah like exactly, us all. Yeah, but, um, exactly. it was a pleasure talking to you and um, best of luck with the future i'm sure we'll collaborate with you uh down the 1 line million percent, and if yeah. you ever need help from us or anything like that just give us a show and if i can help you know where i am as well yeah yeah and thanks again thanks okay. to me okay thanks james thanks to my, be- my beautiful wife on the decks Thank give you. us a wave jill <sighs> <laughs> and look uh, thanks everybody for watching i link all the stuff we spoke about in the description of this video please like and subscribe to our youtube channel and we never really do this but we're going to do it going forward consider contributing to the patreon um we have about 120 people there at the moment they donate a couple of euros the first day of every month really helps cover the costs um the costs are mounting. We're trying to um, expand this. We're trying to grow it. Uh, to get, yeah. Bring in an accountant and bring in a manager. And, you know, like a lot of the work we're doing is becoming unmanageable because it's getting so big. And we just like to, you know. We um, just want to up- update the equipment a little bit as well. Just kind of get everything yeah. the same. Um, it's just to, to make it sustainable long term, we just need more money. And we're trying to work on a sponsor and all that. But at the moment, we've no sponsor. So please contribute to the Patreon. The link is in the description. And we see you all next week, you beautiful people. Stand last. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.